Disruptors and curious minds, what is happening? Welcome to another wonderful episode of Thinking on Paper. My name is Jeremy Gilbertson. I am a uh, thinker, strategist, writer, concept or builder, uh, especially at the intersection of emerging tech and culture, which is what we are exploring today. Mark Fielding is my partner in crime, a brilliant writer in his own right, a synthesizer of trends and happenings in the world. Mark, how's it going today, buddy? Very well, thank you. Yeah, um, a builder of world, storyteller. Um, tell you what, though, I've actually recently branched out into um, web consulting on a little bit of this, and I've just spent the last week chasing the the, the French tax authorities, trying to get paid because of a. Um, I've been working for this Japanese company, and there's some kind of tax agreement between France and Japan, and so yeah, I've spent most of this week not writing but chasing French admin. So I might oh not be doing gosh. much more Web3 consulting and just sticking to my writing. Man, so you got to you got to sell the job, do the job and then sell that you've done the job. So it's like a, uh, yeah, it's yeah. all the way around. Yeah, Amazing. Well, it's not designed for the little guy. I, I tell you what, man, I could get I could get on a rant and a half on this, <laughs> like for for sure, because like, you know, it's not built for independence uh, and it's not built for multi disciplinary independence, which we've talked before. But until we solve that, we'll keep having these wonderful chats. We'll keep unpacking yep. really interesting intersections. The first the, the one today again, you know, Mark, as you know, you know, I love the intersection of, of music in, in emerging technology. I, you know, I, I, I'm fascinated by the ability to reinvent this industry, I think, which certain aspects of it, you know, are, are prime and due for reinvention. And, you know, just to kind of let let the audience know and tee everybody up, because I know not everyone listening is a is a you know is is deep in the music. I know we probably have some people that are that are deep into music, but you know it's it's really interesting to think about how an artist makes money, right? So, you know, an artist can make money by touring. They can make money by selling merchandise. They can make money by streaming. Allegedly, um, they make money by partnerships and experiences. And and the last bit of this, and this is not all of it, but most of it, the last bit is synchronization or what we call sync. And it's basically when you take someone's music and you apply it in synchronization with uh, some of the contracts are funny in synchronization with moving images or moving pictures, which is such old language, but it's putting music in a game. It's putting music on a podcast. It's putting music in a TV show, uh, in a web video, all of that stuff. So we've got uh, a guest today that has some deep experience in the traditional side of what is called music publishing and synchronization, but is also building something pretty cool using Web3 technology uh, related to kind of reinventing that. So without further ado, I would like to bring on our guest, uh, Keatley Haldeman. Welcome, sir. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. Hello. Early bird from the from the West Coast. We always appreciate our West Coast people uh, shaking it loose uh, super oh. early. Yeah, welcome. So I didn't realize you're on the West Coast. So thank you. No, yeah, it's okay. You Mark, it. Mark's already got a pint in front of him. I'm sure it's at the end of his day. But well, um, but keep no, it I'm in the UK, so it's an hour earlier this time. So after uh, we won't. Yeah, we won't hold you yeah. hold you accountable. Yeah. Um, well, Ke Keatley, thanks for being here, man. I'm really excited to dig into your background. Um, and then and then dig into kind of what you're building right now. So if you don't mind, give our give our listeners a little bit of uh, background on where you're coming from. What what you've done in the traditional music industry and kind of how you're transitioning uh, into this new space. Yeah, um, for sure. And, and before I get started, I, I totally feel your pain, Mark, about the foreign tax stuff. Um, my last business, uh, Riptide Music, was a, a music publishing company and a record label. And we did a lot of business with different countries around the world. So different double taxation treaties and yeah. Uh, trying to figure that out and get paid and things get stuck in different places. It's a, it's a nightmare. So, um, yeah, so my background, I, I'm going way back. I started playing music when I was, uh, seven, uh, piano and then drums and then guitar. Um, drums was really the thing that, that stuck with me. And I was in bands from 11 years old till, uh, late twenties, um, some, some form of, of another, um, and then started uh, composing music uh and, and making electronic music and when i was in college and then beyond that and then i discovered music to picture when i was in grad school um it was a, an elective in my grad school where i could i was scoring a three minute uh digital animated short and uh, my eyes were open just like oh i love this, this is great 
then it just, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life after graduating grad school. And my cousin was producing a film and uh, she called me up. She's like, Hey, I think you do music, right? Can you, can you like handle that for me? <laughs> I'm like, sure. I just did this three minute short. How, how hard could a two hour movie be? So I did all of the composition and the sound design and the uh, dialogue editing and music supervision and really everything related to it. So it was just trial by fire and dive in and, and, and figure it out. Um, so then after that, I was like, oh, I really love this. Um, I started a company composing music for TV, film, advertising, and video games. And then I got myself into another band, uh, even though I swore I, I was done with being in bands forever when I went to grad school. Um, so then for that next few years, like half my life was really trying to build this custom composition company and half my life was um, trying to make it with the band. So I produced Nam for the band, uh, a friend. What was the band called? Come on. Uh, that band was called the Collab, but but actually, funny enough, uh, the band before that was called Nine Hertz. And I, I was listening to your uh, your podcast with Inder, and you were talking about the sounds that black holes make, and, and it's some <laughs> crazy low sound. So Nine Hertz is is allegedly the sound um, that if you blast it loud enough at somebody, they will defecate themselves. And we just thought that was hilarious. <laughs> no it was really way. Like, it was it was sound warfare. That was developed in like the nineteen, like early nineteen hundreds. Um, I, I don't know if it works, but we read about it. We're just like, this is amazing. So we well, I tell you what. So I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go like sound nerd on you, like I always do. But like, there that is not far off from the frequency that that the what we call the ionosphere, right, where all the electrical current is happening in Earth's atmosphere. So it's called the Schumann. I think it's called the Schumann resonance, and it's seven point eight. So that's what the world kind of naturally vibrates at. But that's not far off from, you it's know, crap in your pants, man. Like, that's, yeah. Fortunately for the human race, it's not, right? <laughs> That'd be really uncomfortable. Nine hertz. Just to deal with that. But there's, yeah. there's a planet out there. That's I mean, a good nugget. So we, go. so we need to make head, we need to make, uh, you know, uh, earplugs that cancel out that frequency specifically <laughs> when the warfare starts. But anyway, sure, continue. Sure, we, but... we rabbit hole, man. So, um, yeah, so, so that was that. And, uh, so a friend was music supervising a, a surf film, um, just sort of as a passion project. And he used one of our songs and we got paid like a hundred bucks. I'm like, Oh, that's interesting. We can make money. So we're trying to figure out how to make money. This was pre-streaming. This was CDs, but still it's, it's forever been a problem to make money um, as a musician. Uh, so then I got introduced to a music supervisor who was doing an MTV show and I pitched him my band. I said, Hey, check this out. So oh, this is really cool. But what I really need is hip hop. Do you have hip hop? And I was like, Oh, no, let me see. I called up, you know, these the hip hop band that we had played with, asked if I could pitch their music. So then I met somebody else. I think he introduced me to another music supervisor. And I pitched my band. They're like, oh, this is great. What I really need is heavy metal. Do you have heavy metal? So I realized every time I was getting opportunities to pitch my band, people would listen, but they never needed my band, but they always <laughs> needed something. Um, so I'm like, oh, I just need more music. So then I just started putting out ads in Craigslist and just gathering music that I could pitch um, for sync, just you know, non-exclusive representation. We split fees 50-50, felt very fair. Then one of my friends was working for a music company and he gave me a contract that was this kind of contract. I didn't know how to read a contract. So I scratched out their name. I put my name I'm like, here you go. This is, this is my contract now. Um, but, I, but I knew I, I, you know, I could understand that I wasn't doing anything wrong. It was literally just non-exclusive representation. So then that started building, started getting more placements. Then I um, connected with a guy who had a very small music publishing company. He taught me the ropes of music publishing. We ended up merging. Um, and at that time, this was 2005 and, um, a company called Cobalt had just come on the scene and, and fast forward to today, Cobalt's the biggest, are huge. Yeah, yeah, huge. It's the biggest independent music publishing company in the world. Um, they really pioneered this model. I mean, I won't go too deep into this, but prior to them, um, if you want to do international publishing, you either had to go with a major that had offices all around the world, or you had to go with a, a company that had individual sub publishing agreements around the world, or you had to set up your own sub publishing network. But that network means that every sub publisher takes a fee and, and there's a delay in payment. And also you don't have that transparency of how the music is registered in those individual territories. So Keely, could I, could I stop you really quick sure. and, and give, if you could give people the, the high level of like, what is music publishing? Yeah, so there are two copyrights to every recorded piece of music. Um, there's the recording copyright and there's the composition copyright. 
and that composition you know if it's instrumental it's obviously just instrumental if it's a song it's lyrics and melody um, and, and music as well um, traditionally music publishers uh, represent writers and then either own or administer the composition copyrights and record labels own or administer the recording copyrights on behalf of the performer, the artist. Um, that's traditional. I say it's traditional because everything's just morphed in and out. It's, you know, there are there are many fewer rules today than there were before, but I, it, it's it's good to just kind of, like if, you, if, the, if you've got a publishing company that also owns record rights, you could say they also have a recording division. Um, but anyway, so that's what publishing is. It's really managing songwriters and um, composition copyrights. Uh, there are a number of different uh, revenue streams for either side. On the composition publishing side, there are public performance royalties that are paid anytime a song is displayed publicly. That could be radio, TV, um, open air in the malls, um, outside the U.S. on in theater, not in the U.S., and then a few other um, places as well. And then there are mechanical royalties that originally go back to um, uh, having the song the music on a piano roll so literally a mechanical device and then a record a mechanical device and now that's just uh translated all the way today to streaming so you still get paid a, a mechanical royalty for streaming even though there's not a mechanical device it's really the right to be able to transfix the composition onto a physical medium even if that physical medium is transmitted via digital methods um so both of those two kinds of uh, royalties are paid through collective management organizations, CMOs, and there's uh, performance rights organizations, PROs, and mechanical rights organizations, MROs. Um, and so how that works is all of the world's copyrights need to be registered into these different CMOs, and then they uh, collectively bargain uh, and license the music to uh, broadcast radio stations, to YouTube to um, you know TV to Netflix all of these things so anytime there's any kind of new broadcast medium uh, or, or or you know internet channel today they are required legally to go license music uh, and if if you just want one song okay you could go just do a one-off license with somebody but if you want if you are using music if you're a UGC platform and people are just going to upload music then you better get a license or else you're going to get busted for copyright infringement. So, so yeah. So, so Keatley, so the folks on listening right now probably would be familiar with something like sound exchange, right? So how does sound exchange fall yeah. into what you're talking about right now? Right. So I haven't even gotten there. Right. So okay. I, I've just been talking about the, the um, publishing side and I'll, I'll just say one more, one more um, uh, main revenue stream for publishing uh, is sync rights, which we'll get into. And that, that, as you set it up, you know, that's synchronizing music to picture and that's TV, film, advertising, video games, audio, visual NFTs, you know, uh, really anything where there's a video plus, um, music, you need a synchronization license and there is no collective organization in the U S that manages sync rights outside the U S there are, there are, are some depending on the territory. Um, but in the U S it's just directly with the rights owners. And if there are multiple rights owners on the song, you have to parallel negotiate those uh, sync deals. And it's very it's, challenging. It um, sounds incredibly challenging, incredibly complex. And I, so maybe this is a, a question that we'll answer later. As a, I, I've always wondered how much a, a band or an artist gets paid when I walk into a supermarket and I hear their song playing on a supermarket, uh, on the supermarket radio. How efficient is this system of collecting plays if you if you could give it a percentage of I, I write a song it goes out there okay all of the supermarket plays the radio plays the tv ads the the, the this whatever how yeah. what part, kind of percentage do you think is actually collected um very, very little uh very little well, no, that's not that's not true the, uh there's a high percentage of collection there's a very low percentage of correlation between the use and uh, actual payment for that use. So it depends on what it is. If it's TV, actually TV is quite good. Um, the, the system is pretty robust. Radio is quite good. It's pretty robust. If there's a specific play, most of the time, as long as the publisher has done all the things that they need to do to register the song, to turn in the cue sheets, to like chase it up, um, 
like they'll get paid within 80% accuracy, I would say, um, mm -hmm. within the US. If that same play happens outside the US, if you don't have a sub publisher or someone on the ground locally who is doing that work for you, the chances are very low that you're going to receive that money. And even if you do receive the money, you have no idea if it's accurate or, or in the ballpark of what you should receive, which is why there's a whole international publishing administration business that happens. Um, but you talk about playing in a club or in a mall, it's 0% accuracy. So what happens in all those cases literally is, so uh, in the US, there are four major PROs um, and a couple actually like small auxiliary ones, but ASCAP, BMI and CSAC are, are the three biggest. And then GMR is a newer one, but has quite a lot of clout. Um, so how it works there is if somebody opens up a mall, ASCAP and BMI at least are going to come knock on the door and say, hey, you, you, you're, you're open for business. Great. You're this size. You're estimated this many people. Your annual music license is X. And they're like, most people are like, what are you talking about? Why, what is this tax? And they say, okay, don't pay it. And, but if they if they find out that they're playing music in there, they're going to come back around again. And they're like, ah, you're playing music. You don't have a license for that. Now here's your fine. So what ends up happening is bars, restaurants, and, and malls do get a license with ASCAP BMI. That's an annual fee that goes into ASCAP BMI. That goes into the general bucket in ASCAP and BMI. There's no reporting back um, where then, you know, they say, oh, this is your favorite band. You heard them at Nordstrom that they're getting five cents or a dollar or whatever it is. No, what's happening is that goes into the general bucket. There's a credit system within the PROs. And then so if now my song gets played on the radio or on TV, I earn X amount of credits. The, that general licensing bucket, which is what they call that, goes to just increase the value of the credits. So, you know, you could, you could argue both sides. Like I'm not, I'm not angry about the system. Like I think it is what it is. It's about as good as they could do right now, um, but it is not efficient. You, so you went, you went PRO early, which is good. Cause I have a thought on, on PROs, right? So uh, uh, Mark, one thing too. So if you have a band, right. And you have a record and you know, Keatley has a store in London and he plays your record on loop, right? And he's got a license with BMI or ASCAP or whatever. If he plays your record all the time, every day, no matter what, you're likely still gonna get the same check from your PRO just because it's right. not down to the wire like that. But Or what, no check. If you, have, no nothing, check. If you yeah. have nothing else going on, then, there's, then you're not getting reported or maybe you're getting a little bit of money from uh, I don't know, some radio use or digital radio use out there, but you, you know, it's not going to be one-to-one. -one. Okay. So what do we, so we think about now as we move into, and, and we're going to get into dequency and, and, and all the great stuff that you're, that you're doing and how all this stuff is translating. But since we're on PROs, uh, right now, and uh, we're imagining digital experiences, right? You know, I, I'm the metaverse is getting the crap kicked out of it right now, just from a term and nomenclature and all of that. And the tech is, the, the t it's going to take a long time to build the defined version of this open interconnected metaverse, right? But the idea of digital experiences is definitely becoming a, an appropriate medium for, for people. We were just talking about our kids being on digital devices all the time and wrestling with that. Mm. What, what could uh, a reinvention of a PRO look like in a digital ecosystem? Mm. So if I'm walking through Sandbox or I'm I'm, you know, Fortnite's probably a little bit different, but like, how, how would you, yeah. how would you sketch it out if you could do it from scratch and say, Hey, this is going to be the PRO in the metaverse. Sure. What do we do? Yeah. I mean, look, the, 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 the exciting thing about web three blockchain crypto and why I got into this. And I think why most people in the space got into this, because there is this sort of like beautiful vision of direct payments with uh, perfect accuracy, instantly paid, very low fees. You know, the, the biggest thing that's the issue in the music industry is that the, we have a data problem. We have a massive data problem and we have a money flow problem. Um, and it's, it's sort of the forever problem. But the beautiful thing about a smart contract system is you can set up theoretically, um, like imagine this, you have, uh, it, it's a full system where every song is represented by a smart contract. 
uh, and the uh, the splits are all baked in there. Everyone has to agree. So that's you know, let's put that aside for a second. So I'm simply, assuming... so simply put, so let's just. Uh, sorry to keep jumping on you. But I'm trying to sure. break it down a little bit. So say the three of us write a song. We yeah. agree that you know I did a third of it. You did a third of it. Mark did a third of it. That's the splits you're talking about with sure. this. That would yeah. be automated in the smart contract. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, and we call the song "I Love You." Great. So yeah. "I Love You" is the three of us. Now there's a system you can you can make the um, smart contract. It's us three. Now there's a recording at some point. Cool. Now we add the recording. All right. Who are the parties on the recording? Great. There's a producer that's going to get you know 10. There's these musicians that are going to get this. Great. That's all baked into the split. Now that now that split is there. Now the Web three infrastructure, all the metaverses, all the Web three games. You know, and then eventually you get the Spotify's, and then you get the you know the more traditional uh uh players to come buy into the system now what happens is money use happens however that payment is made whether it's a um you know it's going to depend on what it is is it a part of a monthly subscription from someone has someone bought a, you know an nft sync license i mean that's really what we're working on as is somebody uh is there streaming revenue is there an ad share uh, if it's a social media platform like Lens or something like that, you know, there's different ways that money is generated. So you've got to figure out how that is and how the music is 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 um, paid for. But once that's there, money is generated, music is paid for, it goes and sends to the smart contract, hits the smart contract, instantly everybody's paid. That and so everything's digital. Since it's all digital, the data should be accurate and can easily be communicated with a smart contract. Smart contracts is about you know, taking that data, taking the the revenue, and then splitting the revenue according to in the smart contract. So this is an automation upgrade, essentially, right? So normally, what would have happened, Keatley, at least in my experience, there's a spreadsheet that has all this data in it that we hold. There's a spreadsheet that someone else holds. There's a third spreadsheet that someone else, someone else holds, and just this cascading, um, you know intricacy that that could be just quickly and easily snapped up right that's why payments are delayed that's why payments don't hit right is that is that what i'm leaning on yeah a hundred percent i mean and I, i'll just talk about the you know, pro system again just to, to let you know what's going on this this was we have this exact experience um at riptide we had a song that got 90 million streams and it was written by three songwriters then uh and recorded by an artist then at some point the artist is like, ah, I want to, I want in on this song, and everyone's like, ah, okay, even though you didn't agree, sure, we'll, we'll, we'll get you in. The artist consisted of three people, so now there were uh, six people on the song, and now there were four different publishers on the song because those three people were published by different people. So we registered the song here. In fact, we registered the song all around the world. Um, we're we're monitoring the the royalty statements, and we're getting paid in the U.S., but we're not getting paid anything from the U.K. We're like, why? This doesn't make any sense. So we go investigate. There were four different registrations because the three other publishers had registered the song as well with different splits to us. So then that threw that the revenue of that song into uh, it was frozen. So that means nobody's getting paid that. And at some point, if it stays frozen, then it goes into what's called the black box. So within the music industry, there's this term called the black box, which is just money that's generated, that's paid into the system that doesn't leave the system because the system doesn't have the right data to pay the right people. And depending on which territory you have, you, in some cases, you might have a year and a half to claim that money. Some cases, you might have three or five years to claim that money, different kinds of money. And of course, if you have more power, you're going to do better. So the, the majors love this because they're like, oh, what do you mean? You know, they, they, they end up getting, uh, you know, a, a decent chunk of this black box money. How um, much so is sitting in the black boxes? So no one knows exactly, but 500 to 500 million to a billion is estimates that I've seen. And you spoke about like a, you have one year or three years to claim that. And if after that, what happens at the end of that period, the money just stays in the black box? It stays in the black box or it gets distributed, depending on the territory. In some territories, it gets distributed to the, um, the publisher members. And so the major at pro rata. So the majors in every single territory have the lion's share of the right. membership, you know, between, between uh, 65 and 75% of the revenue is, is majors, right? So they benefit if there's black box money, that's just, just like if Riptide didn't have that kind of market share. So if Riptide's copyrights go into the black box, 
then the the people that have much bigger market share benefit from that. So it's it's this constant struggle. I mean, we had I, I mean another situation where we had a song uh, on a platinum selling album, and uh, our our um, songwriter came to us. He's like, I'm not seeing any money. I've never seen a dime from outside the U.S. And this this it was like ten times platinum. It's a massive record. And so we went to him, and what we found out there was a major. So he co-wrote the song with the with the lead singer, and the lead singer was published by a major, and um, they had registered the song all around the world, hundred percent to the to the uh, main songwriter. And our songwriter was unpublished at the time, and he came to us because like I need some help. And so we ended up. It was a three year battle to go and get that corrected around the world with the the royalty societies, and then go get back payment from. Uh, from this major and it was it was a nightmare and it's like they hold the power and, and I'm not even a conspiracy theorist like it just is what it is the, the the point is people need to pay attention and they need to make sure that they have proper representation around the world because that's just the I system because it's completely inefficient me and Jeremy have spoken about a lot of industries and, and the way that you're speaking Keely I don't think anything has ever been more primed for for this <laughs> <laughs> anything we've spoken about it just it just feels like it it needs well, we haven't even talked about sync licensing yet. So this, yeah. this is all this is all just uh, you know licensing for for public performance and mechanicals and, and recorded music. And you you mentioned sound sound exchange. Sound exchange is a public performance right on the recording. So it's a similar concept um, to public performance on the publishing. In the U.S., you don't make it from TV and radio. It's just on uh, digital radio, satellite radio. Outside the U.S., you do make it on on more traditional media. But but for sync licensing that's a its own craziness and nightmare um so if so, you have so, yeah just real quick before we jump into sync i want to i want to tie a button up on this and nash thanks for the comment in the chat great vision here also fun industry to shake up is is what he's saying so thanks for thanks for jumping in um here's my crazy idea for the day keatley okay so yeah. we have all of this you have a data problem right there's inconsistencies and in who owns what you know what percentage it is and if there's a giant pile of inconsistencies that get that gets pushed to the side in favor of more uh, of easier decisions right so what if we enabled music fans to jump in and solve the data problem what if we what if we incentivize them to go hey keely's got this song there's like crazy stuff happening with it everyone else is claiming it because all of these databases are relatively accessible right what if what if i got paid as a music fan for helping you solve a data problem Anyway, crazy idea for the day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I love it. I love crazy ideas. I I think the music data problem is 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 more nuanced than what fans can do because the artists and the songwriters and the publishers don't even know this data. Fans just wouldn't be able to find it. Like, how how are fans going to know what PRO the writer is uh, is with and what their IPI number is? Like the, the writer doesn't even know that and it's not public information. So I think, I, I mean, I love the idea. I love, you know, token powered, uh, you know, crowdsourced projects like that. Uh, but I think this complexity, is complexities are heavy. Cool. Well, let's yeah. dive into sync. You were, you're about to jump right into sync. So let's talk about yeah, what, yeah, how yeah. it all so, applies to that. So sync licensing is hard. Like, let's just start there. And the reason why it's hard <laughs> is let's say you guys for your podcast, you want to license uh, Justin Bieber song. And you're like, man, this is it. Yeah, you know, I'm sorry. You want you want sorry because you're talking about being sorry. I don't whatever. And you, it's a gag, and <laughs> you, just, you just think it's gonna be fun. All right, where do you start? What do you do? You're, you you don't know, right? Like even even people in the industry are like, ah, like where do I start? So here's what you here's what happens is you've got to go look up who are the songwriters, who are the publishers, and you can look that up on ASCAP and BMI public databases or PRS in the UK, and then you'll see who the publishers are. Uh, usually they will give contact information there. Then you've got to go figure out who's the record label, um, which you could find out through Spotify. But uh, can you see me? Yeah, yeah. you're good. Yeah. Oh, Sorry, that, that was weird. My screen cut off. Um, so, but once you know who the record label is, you don't necessarily know how to contact the right person, all that. So that's step one. Before you even get into that, you have no idea how much it's going. I want this for my podcast. Is it $500? Is it $50? Is it $10,000? You have no idea until you go do this research, do this information, contact everybody. And then, uh, and then, you know, hi, please, I'm interested in this. Will you please get back to me? 
they won't get back to you probably because you're not big enough and there's not enough money in it for them. So they'll probably just ignore you. Um, even if they do get back to you, they're going to give you a number that you don't like. And then, um, and then even if you're okay with that number, now you have to parallel process negotiations with, let's say it's three different publishers and a record label for that song, um, different paperwork, because each of them is going to have their own contracts. And you've got to somehow get everybody aligned because everyone wants most favored nations on the um, sync license. That's how it goes. And so when you start looking at TV and film and advertising and major uh, you know, film trailers and all that, they have professional people who are on staff, music supervisors and clearance people that have relationships with everyone, that know what they're doing, that understand how this process goes. And they pay a lot of money for these people and they've got big budgets to licenses. Okay, there's sort of like, I would say it's working, you know, it's not efficient, but, but, but there's a system in place that allows everyone to get the job done. Um, not, I, I could be improved obviously, but where, where there's this massive hole in the world is, and, and where there's more um, volume of production that's happening. And I think will continue to happen is this sort of like DIY small, small team production, like what you guys are doing. Like, imagine you've got a, a I know I have a ton of friends that have like either a side hustle product or entrepreneurs or whatever, this, this new drink, this new product here, this new, this, whatever, this clothing brand, like tons of people. And so they, they need to create these social media advertising uh, commercials. You know, that's a pre-roll for YouTube or, or a Instagram ad or a Twitter ad or something like that. They all have music. Most of them have music, right? Cause music just goes hand in hand with this thing. You want music, yeah. music to help with the emotion of it, to help, you know, give it some life, to have it, make it a more interesting, uh, you know, uh, uh, video. Without music, it's boring. So yeah. where are you going to get that music? Um, so there's this whole industry of online licensing platforms that exist. And they're, they're all, they all work basically the same way. There's some centralized gatekeeper uh, that it, you know says yes or no to the music that's coming on. So if I'm a music rights owner and I want to work with one of them, I have to email them. Please listen to my music. Let me know if I'm allowed to work with you. They can say no for whatever reason. And if they do, that's it. Can't work with them and you know try the next one. If they say yes, then they want to control the entire process. They um, set the license fees. They dictate who gets to use the music. They take up to 70% as commission and up to six months to pay people, um, which is not great for music rights owners. So that, and there's some that are, you know, I would say more artist friendly and some that are less artist friendly, but they all uh, generally work with only what's called one stop music, where it's just a single rights owner uh, for the recording and the uh, publishing copyright for ease of licensing, because otherwise you, you run into all these problems of the, you know, the crazy stuff that we were just talking about. Um, so, you know, we, and my background is sync, as you know, I got very into crypto and we didn't really get into my, my crypto red pill moment. We'll, we'll say that for another day. But, um, you know, when, when, when I really started to understand, um, the concept of, disintermediation, taking out the middleman and smart contracts. And I, I interpreted smart contracts as anything with a real world contract you can automate using smart contracts. Um, and then I have a co-founder who, who told me about this idea in, in 2017 when I didn't understand this stuff at all. I'm just like, no, nah, you're crazy. That, that, that doesn't make any sense. And then, you know, then I got into it post COVID or I, during COVID. And um, I was like, oh, that's what he was talking about. And, and so the through line for me was um, you know, all these online licensing platforms, they are middlemen in between the music rights owner and the licensee. Uh, and they are executing a contract, which is a sync license. It's actually a written contract. So theoretically, we can design a decentralized peer-to-peer uh, -peer system that allows music rights owners to directly license to those that want to use the music without us in the middle, which means that we can charge very low fees because it's very efficient. Um, we can give control back to the music rights owners so they can set their own fees, have approval rights, and they can get paid instantly because it's crypto. So that was the vision for Dequency. And that's what we, uh, raised money on and we got a grant, uh, and, um, we put out the product, uh, last year, uh, toward the end of last year. And then what we've been really looking at since then, um, is the enterprise side of things, because as we, as we built the system, the way that it works is. If you, any, any artist, 
catalog, whatever, can upload their music, uh, set their own fees, have approval rights, uh, get paid instantly. And anyone who wants to use the music uh, for their, their audiovisual project can find it when they license it. They can now either use credit card or pay with crypto, um, but they get an NFT. That NFT represents their license um, to use the music. Now, uh, we're working on functionality to build out different uh, different things that you can do with that NFT. And this is where we start getting into the enterprise side of things. And what I one of the most interesting use cases, I think, is for a decentralized metaverse. So imagine that you have something like the Sandbox and, um, you know, they, they're going to have music compliance issues. So Decentraland last year um, got hit up by SoCan, which is the Canadian PRO, and said, hey, you guys are using music and you don't have a license. And they kind of went on this big, you know, uh, Twitter spaces tour and they being so can to, to, to try to bring awareness to this issue. And uh, Decentraland is like, we're decentralized. We can't get a license for you. And then so can said, OK, then all of your users, all of your landowners, they're liable. So De um, Decentraland brought it to a vote of their DAO and said, should we put money aside uh, out of our Decentraland money to get a license with SoCan? And it got voted down by by the DAO membership it's to say, no, let's just have our, our landowners have to figure out their own licensing and, and get it. Now, what that that is sort of a double edged sword. On the one hand, the landowners will be fine for a while because they're not a big enough target for SoCan to go after one on one. But at some point, if they are and everyone hopes that they will be, because if if there isn't enough interest and in, and in, in volume of usership, in a metaverse like Decentraland or, or Sandbox, then what's the point? Then the, then the experiment failed, right? And if it if there is enough, then they're going to need to get music rights. So people are going to have to figure out this this problem. So back to what I was saying, where 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 what we're thinking about um, could work really well within this scenario is: imagine I'm a landowner, I want to use a song. Great, I go to the the music licensing marketplace. Could be de uh, Dequency. It could be Dequency embedded within. The metaverse because we get we have apis that you can um, ping great i want that song uh that one that one that one maybe we even sell you know nft playlists right you buy the, the the nft and it could be very inexpensive for for these uses now that nft sits in the wallet now uh metaverse codes into their decentralized program that we are going to look at the wallet of the uh, landowner uh, if we detect music, step one, do you, do we detect music? Yes. Step two, is there a license for that music? If yes, play music. If no, silence music. And in that way, they're able to, to protect their landowners, protect themselves while, while remaining true to their decentralized principles. And so that's you know, like one example of how this could work and sort of you know, spread that out on throughout the, the Web3 ecosystem. And, and that's how we're thinking about it. Yeah, really, really cool. Couple, couple it's folks in the chat cool, too. Uh, the the complexity of the publishing and, and sync system is resonating with folks like Michael Frick and Thrive Fighter uh, added a comment too about you know are is there a way to embed like a little mark? And I think people have have messed around with watermarks and and things, but I think it just doesn't scale across the complexities of all the organizations uh, that are around. Um, but what one thing I want to ask you, Keatley, as as a in this example that you just went through right that you have a marketplace you buy an nft the nft gives you permission to use the song for a certain amount of time in certain use cases all of that which can be automated have you thought about uh how because i know other other use cases have been using this kind of functionality having the nft actually degrade uh over the license term right so at the end of the year the nft actually kind of goes away right yeah, no, no we we for sure thought about that. You know, it's an added layer of complexity that we haven't oh, yeah. programmed in. But but I mean that makes a lot of sense because uh, especially with advertising, advertising licenses usually are not perpetual licenses. Um, they're usually a termed license, a week, a, a year, two years, whatever. So it makes a lot of sense for that to happen. And then what's good about that too is you can have alerts set up and be like, hey, it's about to expire. You know, do you want to relicense? Yes. You know, so there's there's added business benefit on both sides. You know, a, a sync license really is an insurance policy for the user to not uh, get hit with a massive copyright infringement fine. So at least professional people who are using music, it, if it's a, a timed license, they want to know that it's about to expire because they don't want to be held liable um, because then it might 
be more costly for them if they accidentally do it. That happened all the time. I mean, I remember, uh, you know, when I was working as a publisher, like we, you, you would do it a year license and then kind of come that year, you're like, all right, are they, are they still using it? Are they still using it? And you want them to use it even a day after it's like, Hey guys, uh, you know, it's this, and then you can charge more because like now, now it's what we would have charged plus some kind of penalty. You don't rake them over the coals, but you like, you get more money. Yeah, it's interesting. Like from a tech perspective, like what is possible versus what is feasible, right? At the moment, based on tech. So the de the degrading NFT, yeah, that could be cool. Like, and what what if what if eventually after after a year, if you have a license to use my song, uh, your NFT has degraded, and at the end of the the degradation of that NFT, the audio assets actually disabled somehow or whatever, right? Like that is like too true crazy. No, I think with right? on that idea, you like actually, I don't know, degrading the NFT is the right word, but you just use an oracle, a, a date oracle, and once the time period is up, the oracle just the, the NFT becomes just ceases to function. And can I ask us what might be a silly question? So, one of the things about so Twitch, YouTube, they have huge issues with copyrighted music. So if you watch, I, I know we love watching people play computer games on Twitch, don't we? And a year ago, everyone was just playing computer games and had whatever music, whatever music they wanted in the background. And it, and it was a big thing. And I think Twitch clamped down on it. And okay, so now the rights, and I think YouTube has the same issues where you can't use the music. Would this system solve for that as well? Is that is that is that a, the wrong question? Is that the same question uh, as the no, it's, it's no, it's a good question. Uh, so how how those other systems work is with a, a fingerprinting, an audio fingerprinting system. So literally they're they're matching, uh, you know, we're detecting music. Are we matching that against a database of other recordings? And then that's the match for it. Um, and for YouTube, that serves, it's called content ID, and it serves as their way of policing, um, allowing uh, music rights owners to have control over how they want the the people to use their music and they can choose. They can say, have an automatic takedown if, if it's uh, detected, um, automatically monetize. So now um, if you're using the song and I've, I'm the music rights owner and I set my song to automatically monetize, if you use my song in your video, I'm gonna serve ads on it. Now, if I'm a professional YouTube video creator, I don't want that because I want the ad revenue myself. So then I have to go negotiate a sync license behind the scenes or there are a few different uh, platforms that will allow you to, to do that. And then now I can uh, keep that ad revenue myself. Um, Twitch is a little bit different because Twitch Twitch has been uh, fighting the music industry for a long time. So um, Twitch, you can't broadly use kind of whatever music you want, like you yeah. can on YouTube. And TikTok has, has done a pretty good job of licensing broadly and, and, and Facebook has as well. Um, but Twitch has been like, nope, we don't want it. So there's there are a few um, platforms that's Twitch approved music, which is all just background. Uh, it's not all instrumental lo necessarily. Like lo-fi stuff, isn't it? Like uh, lo-fi cat. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't even know that it's like lo-fi uh, quality. It's just super indie music uh, of, of, you know, individual artists and composers that have agreed to this. And it's basically, you know, they're not getting paid very much is, is what it is. And there's a direct public performance license that they need so that it doesn't have to go through, you know, the PROs. So um, yeah, and I mean, it gets everything gets complex. Twitter is in a in an interesting position right now. So they just got hit with a two hundred fifty million dollar lawsuit by the National Music Publishers Association for um, copyright infringement. And um, you know, this is a common thing. Like when YouTube came out, it was the same thing. Facebook, you know, all, all of them. Like every social media platform, what the 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 playbook is just just get people to use it because we just need users. Um, hide under DMCA pre protection. DMCA basically says, as long as you get a takedown notice and you take it down, you, the platform are protected. Uh, and so the, you know, they're like, ah, we're protected, we're protected. But what happens is you get millions of users and you get, you know, hundreds of millions of posts. You can't police all that unless you've built your systems the right way. Um, so it just becomes this difficult process. And that's why YouTube and all of them end up going fine. We'll license it, even though it costs millions of dollars a year to license that music, but they need that protection. And then then what it allows them to do is actually integrate music more into the platform and have it, it now they don't have to f like play this game of like, we don't use music, what are you talking about? Now they can actually dive right in and be like, no, 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 we're like we use music hard and it's a big part of it and it's a big draw. And that's why, like, if you look at YouTube, 
YouTube, my stat is wrong, so anyone listening, please don't you know judge me for this. But it's 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 the biggest or one of the biggest uh, 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 places where people consume music. Uh, like possibly, I don't think it's bigger than Spotify, but I think it might just be second to Spotify. And you know, YouTube is a video platform, but it's actually the biggest or one of the biggest music platforms as well. And it's because they dove in and they were able to embrace it and they paid the music industry billions of dollars, like many billions of dollars over the years. And, you know, they started out at odds with the music industry and really just fighting and over that. And now the music industry embraces YouTube because it's, it's been such a great thing for, for everyone. So, you know, over time, that's either how it will go or, or the music industry has shut down systems. The music industry destroyed Napster and Napster is like, we're decentralized. What are you talking about? And then, you know, it doesn't work. I wonder perhaps Twitch could buy up the rights to a to a, a record labels back catalog or something. Um, I'm aware of time, so can we, maybe we could just dig into decency a little bit. So, sure. a little a example: Jeremy and I, we've made a song. We're we're bedroom we're a bedroom band. We don't have a name yet. Walk, how easy is it? So walk us through it. What would it look like for us to get our music up onto decency and? Yeah, what, what's the, the learning curve like? Yeah, so just go to dequency.io. It's like decentralized frequency. Uh, and you can uh, create an account very fast. Um, you can start uploading your music, upload an album. You create an artist profile page. Uh, and um, yeah, super simple. I would say it's, it's a very similar process to uploading to a, a distributor. If you've ever used TuneCore or uh or or distro kid distro or, like or something yeah mm -hmm. yeah S same same concept it'll be similar information um where where it differs from there is because we're focused on sync and so much of sync is also having uh different versions of the audio file so you, you having the instrumental having the stems and having that all um roll up to the main song so we we have that functionality so that a music user um if they if they buy a a, a song they don't just get the vocal, they also get the instrumental and whatever stems to the extent that are there because that's that that helps them um, craft their, their audiovisual production. Um, you can set your own fee. Um, we are in a week, cross fingers, about to roll out a new um, version of the system that um, creates a, a tiered pricing system. In the very beginning, we just it was just free for all. And what we found is on the music right side, like we, we thought that this was a, uh, you know, we, we wanted to give people as much flexibility as, as we can. And then what we were getting back from music rights owners and artists was like, great, what should I price this? So we're giving some guidance to that. Uh, and then the flip is also on the user side. It's 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 not as uh, great of a user experience if all the prices are different. So we're, we have two different um, standardized pricing tiers, a low and a high. And then we're still keeping the option for uh, people to, to set whatever rights they want, uh, whatever prices they want. Up to now, we've only been licensing for Web3 Media. Um, in our update, we'll now be licensing for uh, digital advertising, digital media, podcasts, you know, more, more, much, much more broad um, usage types. And then um, we do have a submission process. The submission is only to uh, verify music rights. It's not a submission on creative. Um, it's not a anything. curate curation approach. It's not a, yeah. it's not a curation. No, we, do, we have some curation in terms of playlists that we, we put out there. Um, but really, we want this to be an open, um, two-sided, peer-to-peer marketplace where, where you know, anybody can make their music available, and the market will decide whether it gets lost, licensed or not. Well, Keatley, I am one hundred percent going to uh, going to put a song up there uh, awesome. in the next few days, just to just to run through the process and uh, see see how it all works. And on the flip side of that, if I'm a um, if I'm a you know podcast producer or something, and I go onto the platform. And let's say, you know, Gregory Isaacs is one of your artists on there and I want to license one of Gregory's songs for mine. It's pretty much kind of one, you know, a couple of buttons and you have it, have it, you know, have it in, in place. Like what, what does that workflow look like? How easy is that? Yeah. Yeah. Super easy. So, um, you, if you, you, you search for the song, you find it, you like that, or you get it from a playlist or a featured artist page. Great. Click there. There's a button that says license. You go license. Uh, you can pay with credit card. Um, or right now we're we're still with Algo, uh, so you can you can um, use Algo as uh, your your crypto uh, payments if you'd like, and then just go through the checkout process. You enter in the the project information. It's, this is the name. This is a, a small description, and then hit license, connect your credit card, and then you get a download button where you can download the music, and you're all set. And if you're gonna if you're gonna upload a song, and you definitely should, that'd be amazing. Wait one week. 
because okay. um, we'll have this new functionality that's there and I would love your feedback. Appreciate it. Awesome. I'm in, I'm in. And yeah, we are, we are running a little bit tight on time, but there is one, great, buy a song. one, one great question that came up um, that uh, is, it kind of ties back to the CMOs and all that. So how's the smart contract adoption rate looking like uh, with the CMOs and the copyright owners? So I'm guessing with, is there any interaction uh, with that kind of piece of the industry with the smart contract? Not with CMOs, um, as I'm aware at this point. I, I'm, I'm, you know, haven't heard any anything from uh, PROs uh, really looking at that yet. I mean, I think I think there's like a few people internally. There's 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 a guy Tanner at uh, SoCan who's intensely interested in this, so I'm sure he's, you know, spreading the word internally. But you know, these organizations are big and old and slow, um, and and very slow to change. And I think there is a general feeling that if there was some kind of uh, single world's database that was a very efficient technology, um, I think that the PROs might might be a little fearful for that. So I, I think they will resist this big time. Um, I have heard some talk about Spotify and some of the DSPs um, starting to look at how to pay into um, uh, with crypto. Uh, with with um, USDC and stablecoin, so I'm really excited about that. Um, but it's you know very very early days. Got it, got it. Another great question, awesome. kind of coming in at the at the tail end here, and then and then we'll wrap it. But um, so Keenan in the chat is a is a sync agent, right? So he loves the idea of this being a peer to peer marketplace. How how could this benefit someone who is kind of living in the middle, helping uh, content creators find the right music? Yeah, think, yeah. So yeah. I. I will say that this was never contemplated to replace um, a white glove service. Um, so, you, you know, even my old company, Riptide, who I'm, I'm, I'm still a shareholder of and I'm very close with everyone there, you know, they are a white glove service sync company. And yes, they have publishing rights as well and, and all that. But um, the, the music licensing is hard. Like it's, it is hard. So the more difficult copyrights and for, you know, creative considerations and all of that requires a human. Um, and if you're pitching to TV or advertising or trailers or video games, high end stuff, um, those people don't want to use an automated system. They're not going to use our system. Uh, they don't use the online systems that exist today. They want to call up their buddy or someone they respect and say, hey, here's what I'm working on. This is the, this is the kind of music I need. Here's some reference tracks. What do you have? Because they know that the music that they send is going to be good. It's going to save them time. It, uh, they're going to help them license the song and and make sure that there are no issues from the copyright side. So th this isn't going to replace that. What we're doing is all the everything else, which is a massively growing space. So it's it's you know it's all the micro licensing, it's the student films, it's the it's the um, uh, you know platforms, uh, technology platforms. And these are not the, the the places where sync agents are playing or 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 even. Um, publishing companies and labels and not really pitching to it because on a, on a single use basis, the fees just aren't big enough to make it worthwhile. And then from a platform wide basis, individual sync agents don't have enough music to really, uh, you know, cater to those kind of platforms or the, or the understanding to license broadly. So I, I Keenan, I would not um, be worried about what we're doing uh, for that. In fact, we're working with a few sync agents who have put their music on our system. I tend to agree. It's that the art and the nuance of finding the right song for the right piece of content is is still going to be highly valued. You're you're making the process a little more efficient. So with that, yeah. um, no, I think there's know, some middlemen in other industries who should be more worried than than you, Keenan, right now. Absolutely. Well, I, I think we are we are over on time, but it was well worth the overage. Uh, Keatley is so such a great conversation. Thanks for getting up super early on the on the West Coast. I look forward to not only participating in in Dequency, uh by uploading a song in a week or so. Um, I, I'm curious to see where it goes and, and, and how adoption and integration into all of these other digital experiences are coming along. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, Mark, do you have any other closing thoughts? Um, I'm fascinated by the idea of this musical black box, which is news to me. And I, I'm, uh -huh. I just wonder how I'm thinking all kinds of a DAO and maybe a smart contract and which parties would have to be involved to move that black box onto the blockchain and make it automated. Um, but that's not 
for we, right we can now. have that conversation next time <laughs> next time um, i saw just one thing i saw that you when you were at stanford you made a um a deck that you could scratch digital files and i saw that yeah. you, um, your old company worked with fat boy slim and so you, you like djs um yeah good djs at the moment who are you listening to oh fred again fred again's amazing fred again um i i had the the joy of seeing him right on stage um my friend he's he was a fan of of my friend um daniel and and so i got invited to go watch fred again on stage and he was like i don't know four feet away from me as he's standing on the deck and just like that guy has so much energy he is so talented he's amazing awesome Thank wonderful you. wonderful well Brilliant. uh everyone thanks thanks so much for listening it's been another Very fun nice. discussion stay in tune uh for what we've got coming up our websites thinking on paper.xyz uh thanks to the youtube folks the uh, linkedin folks and the kick folks for joining us today this will be up on spotify and up on youtube later uh, music has been cleared because, uh, you know, that's very yeah. important to that. Um, and, uh, we also have a town hall episode coming up guys that we're inviting some old guests with some very pointed questions and, uh, discussions. So stay tuned for that. Mark, next week. Ooh, Rock it's and roll. Next week. Oh my gosh. It is next week. Stay tuned. We got to get on the planning for that. But anyway, guys have a great rest of your day. Keely, thanks so much for joining. Thanks guys. Bye.